Oops. Okay. Oops. <laughs> yeah, oops. I broke Good way to start things out. <laughs> oops. Oops. All right. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's Learning Space. I'm Nicole Gallucci. I am postdoc with CosmoQuest, uh, and I have my co-host with me, Georgia Bracey. Hello. Through the wall. And we are joined by Bobek Tafreshi on the other side, somewhere. <laughs> Way Hi. somewhere. So um, we are going to be talking about the World at Night, which is a project, um, a, an astrophotography project we're going to talk to Bobek about. Uh, but first, I want to show you, uh, do a little business and then show you a hands-on demo. Um, so first of all, if you guys are uh, watching, thank you. And uh, please feel free to share the link. If you comment on the event page or the Hangout event page, we will see those comments. Um, read, I, just going to be watching those two sources or the Q&A app. Sorry, three sources or the Q&A app. So don't use YouTube, don't use Twitter. Uh, just use the event pages or the Q&A app to leave us a comment or a question and say hello. Uh, I already have a hello from Nancy Graziano. Yay! You can Hi. watch us now. Yeah, uh, she's helped out a lot at Geek Girl Con with uh, some of the science mm -hmm. demos we did out there. Um, so uh, that's the logistics. Uh, so we wanted to do some more hands-on demos, and I've actually... Um, gotten linked into a lot of good astronomy resources from the Astronomy Ambassadors program that I did back at AAS. We had an episode about that a few weeks ago. Uh, so I want to share a, a demo and a classroom activity uh, that we got called Light Collecting Model. Uh, I will put a link to this PDF in the comments on the event pages. Uh, it says it's, it's been around for a long time and is in the public domain, so no one has been identified as the, the original creator of this. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> it's, it's a, I guess it's a pretty basic mathematical concept. But everybody. Yeah, everybody, everybody does it, so it's, it's public domain now. Um, and this is to, to teach students about how if you incre keep increasing the diameter of your aperture, so for a telescope, for example, you get a lot more collecting area. And you do that with this little bullseye-looking sheet that comes in the packet as well. And you have a little chart. You have a chart to take your data. And I'm going to use this, this Spiffy Planet ruler that is part of our giveaway over on the forum uh, and show you. So what you have your students do is they'll start with one of these circles. Say this is a really small telescope. Say that's like my ETX-90 at home that's broken. Um, <laughs> it's a tiny, tiny aperture. And you have them measure the diameter. In fact, it's about four and a half centimeters, so it's it's a little bit bigger than my, it's smaller than my telescope. Um, you have them measure the size of that, put that in their data table, and then to, to get an estimation of the area without having them do math, because this goes down to grade level four, you want to get a bunch of things to fill out the area. Now it suggests pennies, I couldn't find pennies, but I did find uh, bingo chips, so we had some, some bingo chips in our, our resource center. And so you say, okay, so you've measured the diameter of your first aperture, of your smallest telescope. Now, how many chips does it take to fill in the area? So I'm going to stick some bingo chips on there. Um, normally, you just, you just put them on top on the paper, but so I can hold it up, I've stuck some tape on the back. So uh, okay. it takes four, four. bingo chips to <laughs> fill out that, that little um, square. So you'd put that in your data table. Let's see. Diameter in inches. That's silly. We're using centimeters. Right. 4.5 centimeters. Of course we are. And it takes four chips. Yes, we're using those Doctor Who units. Okay. Uh, if anyone saw Archer this week. Okay. So now you want to move out to the bigger aperture. So this circle two, for example, can measure the width of that in centimeters. Diameter. Cool. Sorry, diameter, not width. <laughs> it's about seven centimeters. Vocabulary. Vocabulary. Words are good. Seven mm. centimeters. So it's not even double the diameter of the smaller circle. But if I start adding bingo chips on and try and fill in all that area. You add them to... just over your first layer? I keep the first layer yeah. in there and I, I add them around. Okay. So it's it's obviously off a little bit because these aren't very tiny. These aren't infinitesimally tiny. But oh, I've added tiny. four. Sorry. And I've gotten about halfway around at two, three, four. It takes another four or five, say, um, I, which I don't have tape for. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. So, okay. It took thirteen bingo chips to fill out that second circle. So you fill out this data table for all the circles. 
and it gives you an intuitive sense without having to do an equation of area is pi r squared. Um, it tells you that, oh, as you, you increase the diameter a little bit, you get a lot more area. So uh, that's a pretty easy activity you can do with students. Like I said, it's rated for grades 4 through 7 uh, according to this, this PDF that I have. I'll share a link to you guys. So that's a little way of demonstrating aperture. And you could probably even, with um, higher level students, have them use the table, use the numbers in this table to then figure out what the equation might be to fit and figure out what the equation for area of a circle is. How can kind make of make a graph? Yeah, graphing. I like pictures. <laughs> Have them back, have back out that equation and, and have them see it in action. So so that's a pretty simple, easy activity, and I'm now very happy with my <laughs> taped on. And like all pictures. great activities, it's just pretty. It's right? just pretty. Beautiful. <laughs> so <laughs> I will share yeah. that link to yeah. the light collecting model. It's also um, art, yes. It's art, yeah, sure, why not? It's art. And so speaking of art. Yeah. Hey. Oh, speaking of art. <laughs> Thanks for the segue, Georgia. Speaking of art, so we have Bobek Tafreshi with us this week, who's going to talk about um, the World at Night project. So uh, we also got a hello from Guido Bibra. Hi, Guido. Hey hello there. from Lillian, ATP, and Paul. <laughs> Paul Stewart comments, the Keck telescopes are going to require a truckload of bingo chips. The Keck telescopes are eight meters across. <laughs> so well, wouldn't that be fun? You can yeah. imagine trying to do this activity for a research grade astronomical telescope. I think a truckload is, is about right. Yeah, truckload of pennies. Fact, yeah. In fact, it's ten meters. <laughs> oh, it's ten meters. I thought yeah. it was eight. I got that one wrong. Yeah, the VLTs are eight. That's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. More bingo okay. chips. More bingo <laughs> chips. Even more bingo <laughs> chips. Actually, if you actually used pennies, I'm sure you could make some estimate of the operating budget of the telescope and or, I don't know, check out the pennies. <laughs> anyway, totally off topic. Okay. okay. Good <laughs> back, back to our main topic is the world at night. Um, so Bobek, you started this project uh, as part of the International Year of Astronomy back in 2009. Yeah, in fact it was it started uh, three years before. So oh, we, oh. Yeah, we created the program in 2006 when we were also planning for the foundation of Astronomers Without Borders by my friend Mike Simmons. So Tuan became the first program of uh, AWB at that time. Uh, we made a proposal about Tuan and I started to invite the photographers, uh, the best of this style from each region. So each photographer is a dedicated night escape imager that means uh, combining the earth and the sky in one shot. So this is a part of nature photography. At the, at the same time, it's a category of astrophotography as well. And uh, these photographers are uh, very often professionally working in terms of living from this. So I invited them from 2006 to mid-2007, and then we uh, launched the program in late 2007 when our website was ready. We announced it publicly by our first uh, astronomy picture of the day. Uh, which was an iconic image by my colleague Wally Paholka. It was the Monument, Monument Valley uh, at the border of Utah and Arizona at night with Mars of opposition right above it. So then later in 2008, we got in contact with uh, uh, the staff of us, uh, the Year of Astronomy, and then uh, Tuan became the first special project of the year. Nice, nice. How many photographers did you start with at that time, and how many do you have contributing now? At the time, it was about 20, and uh, right now we are 33. Uh, we currently plan to invite one or two new members each year. Uh, priority goes to new countries, of course. So has your original group stayed with you all these years, yes, for the most yes. part? Yeah, nearly all of them. Yeah, we yeah. have a couple of uh, Tuan photographers still with our team, but uh, because of family issues, they're not uh, no longer able to create new images. So we might replace a few of these photographers as to their own wish. Um, we fully understand that. But unfortunately, we cannot grow the team very large because of uh, handling this. And also, we, we try to be very selective to invite only the best in this in this uh, field. 
Um, at the moment, I, I, I should also say that there are many more photographers who are really great in this style, especially after Tuan. We made a lot of workshops here and there, and also we publicized this style of photography. Some people from other fields of photography got interested, and now they're doing great, great images. So we love to invite all of them, but then Tuan would be like 200 people. <laughs> it's very hard for me to coordinate it anymore. So how, OK, so I am a total photography noob. Um, I don't even do optical astronomy well. I was a radio astronomer. So <laughs> how do you go about taking images of the background night sky and these, these foreground either natural, you know, natural formations or, or um, like buildings and telescopes? So there is a kind of philosophy behind these images. So instead of starting with the technique, I would probably need to talk about this idea because that makes the whole uh, frame of the image in the mind of the photographer. Uh, first is uh, we, we try to combine the nature and night sky together. One of the main messages of Tuan is to show that the night sky is just is not an isolated universe out there. It's part of our environment. Many people believe that the night sky is only a laboratory for astronomers. That's true, but that's only a part of the definition we're talking about because night sky is half of our environment at night. And this is a big deal if you consider this, then it's half of the whole nature at nighttime. And that means um, people need to communicate with this concept again because of light pollution these days, busy life in modern era. Uh, we're living mostly in cities. Two-thirds of human population are living in light pollution, in places where the Milky Way is no longer visible. So that's, that's a big number of people. Almost five billion people on this planet can no longer see the Milky Way. So the Tuan images are trying to bring back this beauty to normal life, to show that this is just a part of nature. Enjoy it and appreciate it. If we consider night sky as part of nature, then we also can preserve it in an easier way because you can consider it like a national park. You can consider it like a lake, a mountain, and preserve it in the same way. Like in this image, you, you can see that the night sky is naturally looking on the top image uh, from a mountain area in Iran, while only 50 kilometers away in a the city, there is nothing visible. Mm -hmm. in, uh, in the sky of Tehran. So the difference is huge in only 50 kilometers. So uh, another idea for Tuan photography is to show the principles of astronomy, practical astronomy and stargazing. So the photographer plans, plan based on that to see a conjunction, a comet, meteor shower, an eclipse. So some of these images are planned a year or two in advance or just normal constellation images. But um, just imagine you're a wildlife photographer. You go somewhere and going to take a picture of animals. If you don't really know that animal and the difference between them, you're not a good photographer in this field. So in order to do good photography of night sky, one of the principles is to learn about the stargazing mm -hmm. and know where to go, when to shoot. Uh, being at the right time, at the right place, enables you to capture such a shot as you're seeing by my colleague Wally Paholka during the Perseid meteor shower just recently. In August, this is a fireball. Um, in, in another way, it's a bolide. It's much brighter than a normal meteor. It's um, nearly at magnitude minus 10, so it's equal to like a quarter moon, 50% moon in the sky. So these are very rare, and in order to capture it, you, you need to be um, at the right location, the right time during the meteor shower. So then, based on these ideas, the planning is taking place. And then you need to go to the locations. It's different from deep sky photography, telescopic imaging, because you can do it from your backyard, from your observatory. But in this style, you need to do night adventures. <laughs> And I can talk about these stories of night adventures for hours, captured yeah, by I bet police. Yeah, good stories. Yeah, captured by police officers around the world. That's <laughs> oh my, my personal gosh. story. 
<laughs> Do you mind telling us that story? Or? Well, usually it ends up in a very good way, yeah. just giving a quick class on constellations, where is the Big Dipper, where is Polaris, and they're very friendly, usually, yeah. but not all the time, mm. depending on where, which country you're traveling to. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've even had that happen on campuses where the campus police are like, why are you here? What are you doing? What's going on? It's like, no, look, here's my ID. I work for this department. I'm allowed to be here. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, you know, most amateur clubs have a few good stories like that, too, when they go to their dark sky sites and um, or star parties and, yeah, a little initial misunderstanding and then usually yeah. turns out well, like you say. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, but you need to consider that you know people are not familiar with what we are doing. Mm -hmm. You know, you you just show up in the middle of the night in a preserved area, like near a national monument somewhere, because we're going to take pictures of these landmarks at night. And there is a red light coming out of your head with two tripods in hand. You know, <laughs> this doesn't really look familiar to a villager passing by. You know, they don't consider you a torn photographer right away. So it's probably, from their point of view, a wandering vampire or a UFO <laughs> landed in their location. So these are things that people need to consider when they're doing these nighttime shooting. It's best to appear in the area in daytime, before dark, meet the locals, and show yourself, respect their traditions, respect their understanding, and try to communicate with them. So these are mm, things that make it very different from deep sky photography. Yeah. You, need, you need to learn about the local uh, environment because at night you're going to move around, so you need to know where are the obstacles so that you don't can, uh, get ended you know, in, in a valley or somewhere. It's very dangerous. And avoid being alone um, on new locations, so it's better to do like um, in, in a small group of two or three people. Solo imaging is very common by us, but we usually do that uh, when we're going to a known location where we have already experienced before. Like this, this image is from Himalayas, and I was with my uh, very good friend Oshin Zakarian, who's also a Tuan photographer. And this was a perfect combination, two Tuan photographers going to an adventure and this, this is heaven, not only in day, also at night time when you see stars in the crystal clear sky of Himalayas at night. Have you done a lot of climbing as part of your adventures? Yeah, I would say trekking rather than climbing in a technical way because uh, we don't go very high. We go okay. to 4,000, 5,000 meters, which is like 15,000 feet or more. But, I feel that's uh, not very high. <laughs> But yeah, technical climbing is uh, usually much higher. For right. example, those peaks that you saw in the previous image, they're about 8,000 meters. They're some of the highest on the planet. So our mm -hmm. aim is not to go on the top, but look from the bottom and mm -hmm. capturing them with yeah. the stars. So we don't need to be really professional climbers. We're just um, fit and uh, uh, nature trekkers. How much equipment are you usually carrying? You mentioned a couple of tripods and yeah, you very good try question. as little as you can, but it's got to be some heavy stuff. Yeah, uh, I'm, this depends on the personal um, uh, habit of imaging because some photographers are tra very often traveling with their own car and they go to places, uh, to locations where it's right by the road. But uh, I'm on the other side, I, I go with public uh, transportation, we're usually traveling to other countries and then walking to the location. So I'm very compact. I never use more than two cameras um, unless it's uh, planned for a special occasion like Aurora Imaging, which you need more than two cameras. But I have colleagues in Tuan group which are using six cameras at any <laughs> imaging night. And I, I really avoid that because besides being a professional photographer in this society, I like to enjoy what I'm doing. I like to look around, to stargaze with I, my own unaided eyes. Uh, I like to enjoy uh, finding new things in the sky like uh, shimmering air glow or the sudden burst of aurora borealis. And you know, when you're too busy with your camera, you can't really enjoy it. I've been an eclipse chaser for some years, since 95. 
when I saw my first eclipse. So I have seen like 10 total solar eclipses. And after seven or eight, I realized I never see an eclipse. You know, <laughs> I was just looking through my camera. Yes. So that happens very often. So then uh, the 2009 eclipse came, and I had uh, opportunity to see the eclipse for, in, for one minute just with my eyes. Forget about imaging. Mm -hmm. Exactly, this is the picture during that eclipse. And uh, well, hopefully it was long enough. You know, this was the longest total eclipse of the century, nearly seven minutes from our location, which was yep. in the middle of nowhere in the ocean. We got a similar story when we talked to Rick Feinberg about, because um, uh, he does a lot of eclipse tours and yeah. eclipse photography. It's his first time you see a total solar eclipse, just don't bring a camera. Just enjoy <laughs> your first one and, and worry about. I, and I've actually heard the same thing about shuttle launches, too, when I used to, to go down to Cape Kennedy for launches. Mm -hmm. Like, first time, don't even try to take a picture. Just, just enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah, we, you know, some people are professionals. They, they mm -hmm. live based on that. So they really need to make pictures. But if you're doing it for fun, also look around. Also enjoy. You know, It's not only about capturing what is there. It's not like taking a, a heritage or uh, a treasure from the sky. So what, what you see is also a treasure. Yeah. yeah. And Rick is also a very good friend of mine. And uh, we communicate a lot about eclipse imaging. Very cool. So, how how long have you been in? So, how long have you been interested in astronomy, and how long have you been interested in photography? Were those always together? Yes. Or, yeah. Yeah, they were always together since I started when I was a teenager at the age of thirteen, and uh, I became rather, I would say, professional photographer from age of eighteen when I started um, exhibitions. Mm -hmm. So. That's almost um, 17 years ago. So I've been involved with astronomy since teenager time, a bit over 20 years. Wow. Uh, we have a couple more comments I just wanted to check in on. Uh, one from Nancy Graziano again, uh, commenting on what you said about light pollution. She said, I'm 54 years old, I've lived in various parts of the U.S. and only saw the Milky Way for the first time a couple of years ago when I was in Montana. Uh, I was awestruck. So that's uh, a, so I have a similar story in that I grew up in New York City, and it wasn't until I was in college I was out in New Mexico for the summer, and I saw the Milky Way for the first time, and it yeah. just blows you away the <laughs> first time you see it like that. That's true. Yeah, I remember I took a group of um, elementary school students to a desert. And uh, then one of them was looking out from the window from by this minibus and suddenly told me, oh, there is a cloud in the sky. <laughs> it's not going to be clear. And yeah. you know, this was just the Milky Way. Uh, there are lots of people who are not even familiar with how the Milky Way looks. So when they usually look at our images in Tuan exhibitions or an image like this from um, Utah, southern Utah, they they just think that we have fake these. These are <laughs> Photoshop. <laughs> and these are just real images. Of wow. course, they're a bit enhanced in Photoshop with contrast and color, but we, we are very careful to make only realistic images. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't see the colors. That's the problem. So these colors of nebulosity that you see in this picture, as well as the yellow color of the Milky Way, these are invisible to human eyes. Uh, we are colorblind when the environment is very dark. Mm -hmm. We can see color of stars, the brighter ones, of course. We can see colors of aurora when it's bright enough to activate our cells, uh, the cone cells. But we can't really see the color of uh, diffuse objects on it with unaided eyes. So is something like this using like an H alpha filter to no, include no, it, this is. This is just a modified camera. Okay. Um, we it's removed, just the exposure we, time. Yeah, we removed the normal filter, the IR cut filter on most of the, maybe on all of the consumer cameras, the DSLRs or mirrorless cameras, have these uh, IR cut filter right in front of the sensor. So we remove this and replace it with another IR cut filter, which is start cutting right after H alpha. So these, uh, you know, these companies don't really care about astrophotography. It's a very small market for the whole population of photographers. So they don't make 
um, camera specified for nighttime imaging. So they start to cut the, um, the red part of the spectrum right before a child fun, unfortunately. And that's a very important part of the nighttime photography, night sky. Uh, so we replace this filter to add that. But some time photographers are just doing normal cameras, not modified. It's not necessary. What are the exposure times like, probably? Now, I remember when I started uh, photography uh, in, in the teenager time, in order to take a picture of the Milky Way in the way that you, you just showed, uh, I need like half an hour of exposure. That was just 20 years ago. And today, we captured this by 30 seconds. Wow. So these are 30 seconds, and it's important to reduce the exposure to this amount because if you do more exposure, a longer one, then the stars will be trailed in your picture right. because of the Earth rotation. If you make a shorter exposure, then it's uh, the signal-to-noise ratio is not good enough to process the image later on. So this is one of the golden numbers nearly 30 <laughs> seconds. Uh, and you know that depends on your uh, focal lens as well. If you're doing very wide angle lenses, then you can do a longer exposure because it takes longer time for stars to appear trailing in your image. So of course sometimes you, you want to get the star trails because that in itself um, is yeah, beautiful true. as well as being instructive, uh, showing people what the motions of, of the sky, like uh, how long mm, of a star trail yeah. picture would this be? Yeah, favorite um, time for a star trail starts from half an hour and longer time. If okay. you make it shorter, it usually doesn't look that interesting. So this one is 45 minutes. It's from a heritage, a world heritage site in southern Iran near Persepolis. So these are tombs from 2,500 years ago. Wow. And right at the, uh, at the top of the cliff, you can see Polaris at the center of all the trails, yes. Wow. Wow. Just over the rocks. <laughs> yeah. wow. So these um, tombs are nearly 30 meters, um, 100 feet tall. So th this is um, another one of uh, parts of the mission of the world at night is not only is the night sky a part of our environment, um, but this is a, a thing for Astronomers Without Borders as well, is we're all under one sky, right? We all share this sky. Can you talk about the, the international aspect of the project? Yeah, in fact, this is uh, how the world at night created. So this was the very essential message of Tuan. Um, then we, we focus more on nature later on, but uh, the very beginning message that we focused was one people, one sky. So we share the same message with astronomers without borders because these images are trying to show that we just leave, all of us live under one sky. You see Orion in these images over uh, Monument Valley in the U.S. At the same time, you see Orion over Alborz Mountains in Iran, thousands of kilometers away in two countries widely separated not only with geographical uh, terms, also from political terms. But mm -hmm. we, we just showed that people who are interested to the night sky, they no longer care about the political borders. They join together, they make friendship. Mm -hmm. And this is a new way to bridge between civilizations. It's not really a new way, it's just um, renewed by Tuan. It's been all time here through the history that people with same passion cross the borders. Um, and you, you can see moon above uh, a temple, a Buddhist temple, at the same time a mosque, a church. So these images are trying to show that uh, various religious, cultural um, landmarks of our planet are all under one ceiling, under one roof. And under this roof, we are just one family of humanity living in one house. Here's one of them. I was trying to find it as you were, as you were going. This is uh, also again in the Himalayas. Yeah, that's Capella, the bright yeah. star. Mm. Capella, just right above Everest, in fact. So I like that you actually have the diffraction spikes that stand yeah, out is, in the image. Yeah, this is uh, with with an additional fin filter in front of the lens, uh, a star filter. Okay. Let me get that. 
I'm so glad screen share is working today. <laughs> Otherwise, we would not be able to see it. Um, and then I wanted to, to go to the uh, picture. You have Orion over Dubai. Where is it? Right here. So here you can just, so this is another city. There's you, and then another city, cityscape here. Um, and you can just barely see Orion. Yeah, right that's now. exactly Dubai. where one of the places I've been captured. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, one of the times you're actually in front of the lens, right? Yes. This is yeah, rare. I mean, captured not only by camera, also by... Ah, oh, that was really <laughs> captured. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, there's Orion again. Yeah, yeah this over one Monument from, Valley. Uh, Monument Valley. Mars is the bright point on the other side. Right Mars becomes uh, the second brightest planet in the sky occasionally when it's mm -hmm. at good oppositions like this time. Was this in 2003? Something fabulous. Yeah, this one is seven. You know, but yeah, seven. seven. Okay. Yeah, that three was the most favorite. Three is the one that I remember yeah. from college. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I have to show this one because not okay. Not only do you are you showing um, natural landscapes, but you're showing um, cities. You're showing um, some other human-made instruments, such as my favorite, the Alma. Oh, wow. Sure, as right. a radio astronomer, of course. I know. I, I was not at the high site at night, unfortunately, but this is, again, this is uh, oh, another okay. Star Trail photograph. Um, and notice a big difference for, for all the people living in the Southern Hemisphere. There isn't a star that's right <laughs> at the pole there. Yeah, yeah it's an right. emptiness of South Celestial Pole, as you can yeah. see there. But, you know, this image is one of my favorite, too, uh, because of the location. Mm -hmm. It's not easy to get this picture. You definitely know that these antennas, the beaches, are moving very fast. So mm -hmm. uh, they're not going to last very long fixed at one direction. And in order mm -hmm. to get a long exposure star trek, you need like one hour of fixed um, pointing of the dishes, and it was very good occasion that I captured this. In fact, uh, there's only one Star Trail, good Star Trail image of Alma at the moment because of this issue. And at the same time, radio astronomers often do not care about lights. So that's why on Alma radio dishes we have a lot of projectors, security mm -hmm. projectors, and uh, we ask uh, the astronomers to turn them off. Uh, uh, Otherwise, we couldn't really take good pictures. I'm going to be at Alma again in uh, in one month. Oh, excellent! Uh, on another ESO mission, so we hope to make a lot of new pictures. We will be uh, two Tuan members and two other colleagues by ESO on a mission to several sites in Atacama, including Alma. Very cool. Um, yeah, the it's, it's not easy to be up there, as you yep. know. It's uh, 5,100 meters high. Yeah. And uh, if you want to be there in long term, uh, you need to pass some tests. And we also even carry some oxygen capsules in case of emergency. Were you there for the opening, the inauguration? No, no. The ESO no. Group? Okay, because they made us pass a physical, but it was a really light physical since we were only going to be up there for a couple of hours. Yes. Um, so we got yeah, off. We no got problem. off easy. We got off easy. But uh, did you have to do the nose tube oxygen? Yeah, I didn't use it, uh, but another okay. colleague had to use it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it becomes harder at nighttime, and when you're there, you know, four or five nights mm -hmm. uh, at minus 20 degrees Celsius, uh, Celsius temperature, it's become, especially with the wind very high, it's becoming uh, a bit challenging. And although radio astronomers don't care about optical light that much, I had the same problem when I'd go out and visit Green Bank in West Virginia, uh, they do care about radio frequency interference and so, so the CCD chip in your camera could cause interference and so you oh, probably have to schedule with the astronomers um, mm -hmm. when you're doing this photography. I know that people have had to do that for the VLA. You have to schedule with the observatory when you can do that photography. Uh, or yeah, that exactly. RFI. One of our photographers have been to SKA yeah. in Australia recently and he was probably the last person imaging there because they, they don't allow any photographer with active sensor to be at the area again. Oh. I may have, I had I had last year's calendar. There was a really pretty um, Milky Way show. Was that the South Africa site or the Australia site? Australia site. Australia site. Okay. I was at the South Africa site and I don't have a good camera so just standing on, under the dishes looking at the Milky Way I was 
you know, blown away by it, and I'm glad somebody finally captured that. But yeah, now yeah, but that they're putting the, the um, restrictions in place, there's going to be less of that. Yeah. Speaking of observatories, I'd like uh, to add that uh, we're working on a project called um, the, World at Night, uh, the World's Observatories. And we are trying to document all the major observatories of the world in, in terms of Twana-style imaging. So if, uh, if you go to twanite.org slash observatory, you will see maybe 35 observatory of the world. Um, photograph at the moment, some by still images, some by time-lapse videos. And we hope to com continue this in collaboration with various observatories around the world. Wow. I just, I just opened that up. So we've got VLT, you have uh, Arecibo. That's very cool. All right, I will put a link. So yeah, so, so, twa so twanite.org slash observatory. So yeah, that's the short link. We have many of these galleries. You're speaking of mountains, for example, right. slash mountain takes you to a tour around the world and <laughs> up, you know, cool. mountains of the world. Yeah. Wow. Or twanite.org slash comet slash meteor eclipse. So all these are existing there. But easiest is just going to the search, twanite.org slash search and search and as you wish. And there are galleries by region as well, so you can look at Africa, yes. the Americas, Middle East, even the polar regions. Yes. That's pretty cool. <laughs> I was wondering yeah. if you had someone assigned to Antarctica. Well, we have a permanent <laughs> photographer in Arctic region. Okay. Uh, but, well, we have a candidate photographer to be a Tuan member in future who is time by time in Antarctica at the South Pole, the station. Right. Um, so that's a possibility. Amazing. Now you mentioned time lapse, um, and I did see somewhere a link, I think, from your website um, for Alma, and there was a time lapse yeah. of Alma, which was pretty amazing because you talked about trying to avoid the telescopes moving, but here you could actually see them. And and I believe was that yours? Did did you do that time lapse? Probably mine or Christoph Miley, my colleague. But mine in time been, lapse, we love yours. To. But yeah, talk about the time lapses. How are are yeah. most of the photographers doing those, or is that just something that a few people... Yeah, it's yeah, very interesting. Um, you know, this type of photography is really emerged. When, when we started, there were only a dozen or two dozen of photographers around the world who were doing time lapse. Mm -hmm. So I remember there was so few resources, um, only one American um, cinematographer who, who produced uh, the famous documentary Baraka, if you've seen it, it's from the 90s. Uh, so this was uh, the beginning of time-lapse photography in, uh, in very high quality. He, he actually made one of Comet Haley. Uh, but when I started uh, digital photography of night to sky in, I think, less than 10 years ago, there were less than really five people doing this taking pictures of night sky and time lapse. Now I can tell you in the US alone there are over 1,000 people doing uh, in a very good quality time lapse videos of night sky because um, not only of Tuan and workshops and the website we're doing in a larger um, medium we have the new generation of DSLR cameras. They are lower cost, very good quality, and that enables you to make uh, time-lapse images, time-lapse videos that are even good for 4K resolution. That means uh, ultra high definition TVs that we are looking forward to them. So we I'd actually uh, ties into a question we got from Nancy Graziano. Typically, what equipment do your photographers use? Do you have professional level DSLRs? Or are consumer grade DSLRs uh, with decent lenses sufficient for this kind of photography? Yeah, well, you know, we, we live from this. So we, we use professional uh, mm -hmm. full frame cameras, but it's not necessary. You know, if you like to do some very good images to enjoy, to share, and even to publish, it's not necessary to have high end uh, full frame DSLR cameras. You can use crop sensors, you can use mirrorless cameras. Uh, you just need to consider a, a camera that is less noisy at night time. 
-hmm. And uh, those cameras are usually not very high megapixels, so don't be fooled with the uh, number of the megapixel. Uh, lower sometimes is better because it gives you larger pixel size in the sensor and that increases the sensitivity and that decreases the noise. But on the other hand, very important is lens. So very often more important than the camera is the lens because we need fast lenses. So those kit lenses coming on a camera which is very um, long range of zoom, like 18 to 200, this doesn't really work well in nighttime photography. The layers of optics reduce the photons that you can capture in the sensor and uh, you lose a lot of photons on the way reflecting from these layers of optics. Mm. And they're usually not really at high quality, they're kit lenses. So avoid uh, using long, long range uh, zoom lenses. Uh, mm. Best is of course prime lenses, that means fixed uh, focal lens like 24 millimeter 1.4. This is one of the golden lenses of night escape photography. So it's the s same <laughs> principles that apply to professional telescopes as compared, you know, it's low noise CCDs and and less things in your optical train. You want to preserve <laughs> every photon pretty much. That's mm -hmm. what drives me oh, just about cell phone cameras is they keep adding the megapixels, but mm -hmm. they are the noisiest chips. Either they're the noisiest CCDs or the other electronics in the phone are, are causing all the noise on your uh, chip. Uh, I mean, I'm, we mean electron noise, which is something different from sound noise here. <laughs> I'm sorry to be screwing up terms, but uh, yeah, that's, uh, that, yeah, that sounds also, like similar principles. Yeah, <laughs> exactly the same. But I also like to add that uh, there are usually in these companies, there are two groups working parallel. One is uh, working on the sensor, the other in, on the processor, so they're mm. also improving the processor to reduce l less noise to noise reduction inside the camera, like mm -hmm. the Nikon D8, D800, which has over 35 megapixels, is rather low noise camera, it's quite surprising, so the other group has been very successful in this camera. But it's still, it's not comparable to a good full frame at uh, between 11 to 20 megapixels, these are ideal. And at the same time, I'd like to add uh, that it, more than camera and other equipment, you need uh, the passion to do very good nighttime photography because this style of imaging needs patience and at the same time sense of adventure, traveling. So these are the things that really helps you besides uh, knowing a bit about the night sky is very important. Knowing more helps you really a lot. How many pictures do you take before you get one that you really like? Do you have? Is that um, quite a? Quite yeah, a <laughs> for for those, <laughs> well, for those who are doing time lapse images, they um, like when I'm doing a time lapse image. Um, usually, one scene takes one thousand shots or two thousand shots oh. to make one video, which lasts thirty seconds. So you, you create a lot of images these days when you, you, you're doing time lapse. But in a still photography, usually from each uh, three or four image, I have one very good shot. So I don't really do a lot of images uh, because of my experience in film cameras. So I'm still doing the same habit. But those who have started with digital, they, they usually do more and more uh, tests until they get one. Uh, it's good because now more people can do serious photography, can share their passion, can share their point of view in photography by just trying. But it's also bad because now people don't learn the technique and principles of photography, uh, which was essential during film time, film time mm. in analog imaging. Uh, speaking of analog, there's also one interesting gallery on Tuan, tuanag.org slash analog. And there you can see all the images we have on film. Uh, some are even new. Wow. Like made in 2013, we have one crazy photographer who is still doing <laughs> imaging on analog cameras. And he's making amazing pictures with Excellent. analog camera, which is made in 1960s. Okay, this is the first one, and uh, this is great. why I went wow. <laughs> this gorgeous color shot mm -hmm. of of the aurora. 
Yeah, is this, this is my Pekka. No, uh, well, this one as well, but he's uh, rather retired at the moment because of the age. He's doing time to time, but he's still on film cameras. He's living in Finland. Uh, one of the, uh, I would say, pioneers of nighttime photography. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, and I wanted to show the Aurora shots that you took as well. Uh, because I, I still have yet to see um, an aurora myself, so maybe you can tell us a little bit well, about these shots. What, what, what latitude like you're located? Oh, we're in. Where where are we, Georgia? <laughs> about forty one. Forty one. Yeah, we're, we're oh, a bit that, too low. Well, that's good uh, because you know at the moment we have very active mm -hmm. uh, area on the sun, nearly facing the earth and. Uh, if this I keep hoping. We have the clouds to go away. You can, you, we have seen them. Yeah, if that uh, generate an X flare in mm -hmm. the next one or two days, you might even see aurora <laughs> from 40 degrees in the U.S. because uh, the Americas are pointed towards uh, the, um, the magnetic poles. So mm -hmm. at 40 degrees, you're at the magnetic latitude of nearly probably 48 or 50 degrees depending on where in the U.S. you're located. So it's much better than the Eastern Hemisphere uh, <laughs> to see the auroras from lower latitudes. This one in Norway, uh, this one in Sweden, in Lapland, is, uh, was my best aurora experience ever because that was during the solar storm that reached the Earth and uh, we had four nights of aurora like this. Wow. Yeah, uh, these things I can't, I can't forget ever. You know, I, I can just remember it second by second. It was mm -hmm. so stunning uh, when this crown of aurora were just boiling overhead at the zenith with colors changing any second and waves of motion. So still when I'm talking about it, I <laughs> get quite touched. So it's an, it's an experience anyone uh, could do, can do, should do in, in lifetime. I lived in Virginia for just a few too many years, although that was during the minimum. The last solar maximum, I was living in Pennsylvania, so similar latitude to where I am now, but um, a few times there were some major flyers, it was cloudy. It was always cloudy mm. in Pennsylvania, so I have yet to, to see it. I think I need to go up to Michigan or somewhere like that. Or just, you know, just a quick flight to uh, either Yellowknife in Canada yeah. or Fairbanks in Alaska. All right, Canadian friends, we're visiting. Yes. So these are two of the main yeah. aurora destinations, Yellowknife and uh, Fairbanks. In, yeah. in Europe, Tromso in northern Norway, so these are very famous aurora destinations. I yeah. wanted to show yeah. this image as well because this is a, a single exposure of the moon setting. Um, and... and, and so many people in film get, you know, or or uh, in art get the moon size and position wrong, uh, and so we don't. But this this is an actual shot of of the moon setting or rising. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, well, one thing setting. I'd like to add is that all the pictures on Tuan are mm -hmm. actual photograph unless right. we unless we uh, declare in the caption that this is a photo composite for educational purpose. I see. Otherwise, yeah. if we have not mentioned that, this means it's a real image. A uh, real image, of course, is very uh, controversial uh, definition at the moment. Even <laughs> in other categories of photography, there are even exhibitions going on to uh, try to describe people what has changed in photography these years. So any picture is enhanced these days. But speaking of real, that means it's either a single exposure or it's a panorama, panorama a stitch of several images with the same setting made at the same time, or it's a, a simple star trail. That means a stack of you know, many images with the same setting. If yeah. you have made one picture with a different lens and another one with a wide angle and merged them together, this we call a photo composite or a photo montage. We usually don't do that in Tuan. Uh, just that's a personal taste. I don't uh, blame others at doing this. This could be another category called like uh, graphic art or mm -hmm. photo montage. So uh, composites are also mm, appreciated a lot as art or for educational purposes.
But my personal taste and some other of my colleagues are just single exposure like this image. So I plan in advance. You know, I live not far from Paris. I live in, in Germany. And it's nearly 2 a.m. At, at the moment. So, um, so you're, you're, uh, you're, you're, one of our listeners, Guido Bibra, uh, joins us every week from Germany as well. So <laughs> you can wave at him. <laughs> yeah, so it's just two hours train distance from uh, Paris. So I, I planned in advance, and I went uh, to the location, which was very easy this time. It was in the middle of the Concorde Square to capture this shot. Uh, you can see a few stars above the moment. These are not the stars. These are the lights at the top of the towers oh, wow. at the, at the uh, modern part of Paris. Yeah, because I, I, usually when I see pictures like this, it is a photo composite, but this one is not. And so that's why yeah, I, really, this, I really love this image. Yeah, this is a telephoto image by 400 millimeter focal lens. Um, from this range and upward, you get to see a lot of details on the moon. Mm -hmm. So some so of us are using even telescopes for these shots. Oh, do I? I don't know if we have any of those up. Um, Oh, there's a picture here. Uh, we have a, a question from Guido. Uh, so he, I guess it is, is watching from Germany. He's, he says, your profile says you're from Germany, and you also have Iran as a location. How did this come about? So you're yeah, originally I'm, from I'm, Iran. Yeah, I'm Iranian, and mm -hmm. I have moved to Germany less than three years ago. Mm -hmm. um, because Tuan has different um, coordinating offices. These are, of course, all you know unofficial, but uh, we have members representing Tuan and coordinating our events. Uh, one of our main office was in Germany at this place that I'm living. So I'm working with my colleague Gernot Meiser and uh, two, three other German photographers here to develop more European programs at the moment. So okay. in next year or two, I might move to the US to develop this more in, the, in that area of the world and help my colleagues there to do this. Very cool. And then so, to Japan. Then, so. you're just, is, there, is there a continent you haven't been to? I was going to say, where haven't you been? <laughs> yeah, I've been to all the continents. You've been to all the continents. OK. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. What, so um, maybe before we wrap up, what in addition to this night sky photography, what other photography do you do? Well, I do general photography, travel photography for National Geographic. So mm. that's how I mainly live. I'm a National Geographic okay. photographer for the collection, but not for the magazine. You know, there are different areas of National Geographic TV, collection, magazine, website. And uh, for those images, I just um, uh, give to the collection at National Geographic. But at the same time, I'm also doing uh, science journalism. That was my main work, in fact. Before Tuan, I was the editor-in-chief of an astronomy magazine in the Middle East uh, called Nuju, or Astronomy, for maybe 10 years or so. And uh, I was also contributing time to time to Sky and Telescope. But I still do. I'm uh, a photographer, official photographer for Sky and Telescope. Um, but uh, I also write articles once or twice a year for them. I grew up I grew up reading Sky and Telescopes. That's that, yeah. that makes me so happy. But I grew you know, when I grew up in New York City and couldn't see anything that <laughs> they were talking about. So that's really cool. Uh, and and what is the URL for your website? I'm sorry what? Do you have a website as well that you oh, like yes. to share? My my personal website is a dreamview.net. Okay. Dreamview.net and uh, you can see more of my images there. Only a small selection goes to Tuan. I, there I have also daytime shots. Uh, it's shared with my uh, colleague Ocean Zakari. Uh, I also like to add before we finish that uh, at Tuan, we are very proud to have uh, some members who are you know, iconic people in the world of astrophotography and astronomy, like uh, David Mailing. Uh, he is a Tuan member and consultant to our group. From the beginning, so David um, is perhaps the most accomplished astrophotographer in the history, and he, he generated some of the techniques we use today, like unsharp masking or develop some other techniques. Uh, first time doing really good uh, color imaging of deep sky using the Australian uh, telescope, the, uh, the 3.5 meter telescope um, in Kuna Barbara. So. It's really an honor to have him, or my friend Fred Spenak, who is um, 
uh, a retired astronomer, now more astrophotographer. He is known as the Mr. Eclipse because of his eclipse chasing, as well as uh, many others, like Denis Tuchico, who is um, a well known editor at the Sky and Telescope magazine. So these people, I, I think, really helped Tuan to promote itself and build uh, a community itself. Um, and, you know, at the same time, communicate with the others, with people in the world of astronomy and photography. So I, I'd like to thank, thank them all. So are there any opportunities coming up where either uh, current astrophotographers can improve their skills or newbies can get started? Do you have any workshops or hangouts or anything yes. like that coming up? Yeah, we have uh, physical workshops at the moment planned, uh, hangouts, so we don't have any in the uh, close coming future, mm -hmm. uh, but we will announce that on Tuan. But physical workshop is one one long one we have for one week, which is a great even in La Palma. La Palma is in the Canaries, where one of the major observatories in the world is located, and it's a paradise, really, for nature and night sky. It's the it's darkest location in, in Europe to enjoy the night sky. So this this uh, workshop is from May 20 to 27. Uh, it's a one week, including some tours around and stargazing photography at the top of the island where the observatory is located. Uh, another workshop is in the Himalayas by my friend Ajay Talwar in uh, India. It's March 21st for three days. And we have one workshop in Iran uh, in two weeks where I'm going to attend, uh, late February, and uh, one in Germany in, in July. So these are the next one. But the main one is uh, in, in La Palma. That's yeah. our main focus at the moment. That's Astro Master. Astro Master, we call it. Uh, it's actually, oh, by the way, it's actually nearly full at the moment, but uh, we are going to do another one in September in case someone applied and there is no place. Uh, most probably we will repeat this in September, which is also a very good time for this so, kind so, of image. So if you go to the Tuan page, uh, twanight.org, uh, click on events over on the side. That'll show you some of these workshops. Yeah. Or just tonight.org slash calendar. There you go. <laughs> There's the short link. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Georgia, I'm sorry, did you have a question? I cut you off. No, I was just going to ask about the level of photography that you need to have to do the workshops. Do you, are they you know, for beginners? Are they more advanced? Yeah. Does it matter? Yeah, uh, the La Palma workshop interested? is for average photographers. So mm -hmm. it's, I don't recommend it for very beginners because we start an experience. Yeah, we start yeah. the time lapse right away in this workshop. But some experience. It's not really professional. But you do have uh, a couple of articles on, on here under education where people can get some starter tips. So there's lots of places online, uh, including yes. their website, where you can kind of get Yeah, started. like uh, people can go to um, Jerry Rodriguez's uh, website uh, that, that has huge number of uh, articles on Photography. I time to time publish these articles in Sky and Telescope magazine, mm -hmm. but on Tuan website, as you mentioned, we have only a few. Um, we're going to add more. Cool. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Bob. Especially mm -hmm. at uh, super super late at night for you. <laughs> so, oh, my pleasure. Yeah, um, no yeah, thank you. So a couple of uh, announcements to end the show. Uh, we have, what do we have coming up? Uh, Friday will be the weekly space hangout, which is hosted by Fraser Kane. It's at noon Pacific. So join us. We'll be talking about all the top stories in astronomy and space this week. Um, I see I could take a peek at the spreadsheet and see what we have coming up. <laughs> I can do that. Ooh, we have a new impact crater on Mars. We have an asteroid dual personality. We have Venus in 2014 and a whole bunch. Oh, here we go. Wobbly alien planet with weird seasons. So those are some of the topics mm -hmm. we'll be talking about this uh, this Friday on the Weekly Space Hangout. I'm so glad I, f I found that link without looking too hard. Um, Sunday night is the virtual star party. Uh, Scott Lewis will be hosting this week. I think Fraser might be out of town. And I will actually try and join because I was recently going through some of the old virtual star party videos. And I miss <laughs> the virtual <laughs> star party. So I'm going to try and make it Sunday night. So that is Sunday night. I think 6.30 Pacific is the current start time 
Um, so check that out on Google Plus as well. Uh, Astronomy Cast Recording with Fraser Kane and Pamela Gay happens Monday at Dune Pacific. And then we come back around to Learning Space on Wednesday. Next week we'll be talking about Pocket Cube, which is a very tiny, tiny satellite that students can build uh, and launch and send up on their own. So we'll be talking about that project next week right here on Learning Space. And another um, demo. We have another demo. Should uh, what, What's the demo? How high up is space? That's what we're going to talk about next week. Oh, excellent. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. I, have, I haven't put that one together yet. We'll see. OK. All right. Thank you, Bobek. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thanks Thank so you. much. Great everyone. to talk yeah. with you. Great. My pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so, so much. Clear right. skies to everyone. Clear skies, yeah, indeed. Definitely. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Good night. Bye.